brotherhood and the sisterhood relationships that we have formed. We got to learn one another's cultures and we formed a very firm bond because we were able to exchange ideas, we were able to assist one another with workforce. If I'm all alone on my farm and I need people to come and plant windbreak or put up a fence and then I could reach out to them, which is support that I didn't have before. What's particularly special about the group is that um, they've come from different areas and they're still together after all this time. They're still um, communicating, they're still sharing information, they're still putting time into the workshops. They're still taking time out of their daily routines and the time that they could be spending uh, on their land farming. Um, and so their dedication to the process is also telling about what they are getting back from it. Research is very much about asking a question, waiting for the response and recording that. Whereas this type of research is a very different way of doing things because it's, it's about building that trust and it's about building the relationship and then you can actually delve deeper. Because yesterday what came out of the workshop was the frustration over the years with researchers um, that would harness the, um, the information but sometimes not even credit the farmers for that information. Here yeah, is a diary where you need to write every week what happened to your farm, what were the challenges, what did you plant, what did you harvest, where did you sell. Let me discuss these results together and I feel that was a very powerful way for the farmers themselves to understand their perception and to understand their involvement in a very broken food system. When you have a generational a history of being told that your voice actually doesn't count. You almost have to learn to physically be able to voice your opinion. It's not just feeling that you have something that's important to say or knowing that you have something important to share. It's also a physical barrier that needs to be overcome. And part of that is knowing that you can safely share what you feel about something. Yesterday, I, I definitely noticed um, a change from last year to this year and just the interactions, the familiarity between them. Uh, I think also their understanding um, the, the different characters. Um, so interpreting where it's coming from and not just what's being said. So that's definitely grown in a communication and how they even communicate with one another has been amazing. So the workshops have come really from the needs of the farmers that have come out of the research. So if there's been a gap that's been identified, then we'll focus in. Then we will construct and create a workshop that speaks to all those questions and then have a dialogue. And then we'll write something thereafter that comes from the preparation for the workshop and then what's come out of the workshop as well. So the thing that gets documented is much more collaborative. You're only going to have discussion taking place from within is when they feel safe in that space. And that is what has taken time to create. We're from different areas, you know, and I think we, we didn't have, have become so close and even personal, uh, knowing each other inside out, you know. Uh, but this initiative really brought that about. It's now like we've grown up together. I've never been part of a research group where there has been such reciprocity and such inclusivity. One of the outcomes that's not really written about is this sense of um, trust and people are able to say things that they wouldn't usually talk about. Another thing that, I, that instilled me is being able to share my knowledge, my experience, even my indigenous knowledge and be able to make use of it, not to, to be ashamed of it. And 
what struck me the most was her ability to communicate in a very different way with the farmers and the way they were reacting to what she was saying was very different to what I'd seen before in the many workshops that I'd done with small-scale farmers. And it was also the first time I'd experienced um, a researcher or an academic um, basically tell farmers that organic farming is not just the mere absence of pesticide. And this is the, the narrative and the story that they have been told for decades. Yeah, the main outcomes of the process is that um, there are so many power relations farmers are dealing with every day. So they are dependent on policy, they are dependent on a very complicated way of accessing lands. So they are dependent on inputs and inputs are extremely expensive. So with an average income of 500 rands, you can't afford compost and you can't afford seeds. So these farmers are then dependent on the Department of Agriculture, on subsidies, on NGOs who are providing subsidies. The next dependency is created by their marketing channels. A retailer system which takes the produce out of the communities, out of the townships to a wealthier community, wealthier neighborhoods in the white, mostly white areas of, of Cape Town. And farmers are price takers, small scale farmers are price takers, I think all over the world. And especially in Cape Town, we found out as farmer group, and it was very powerful for the farmers to really understand that they have no clue how prices are made and what is the real value of, of their produce. For example, if they come to my farm, I will rather ask you how much do you want to buy to pay for this instead of me being confident confidence and say this is how much I know but the market made us aware that you need to calculate your cost. The farmers in the community gardens would sell the produce to middle class communities and would get the income and purchase food from the supermarkets. If the logic was inverted that they actually sold the goods locally it would address the local food insecurity problem, which is endemic, and it would be able to generate some income for it. And then we come into the whole discussion of food justice and who deserves what kind of food. When I walk into the shop, I'm not comfortable buying it because I'm going to feed my family. And secondly, if I, if I keep on buying in the shop that is not chemical free, I'm actually supporting something to keep on going. And now the knowledge that they have gained uh, over this research period, they can share that because it's no point in just having sustainable farmers if we don't have sustainably minded consumers or sustainably minded communities. Oftentimes when you sell to other markets, you meeting the food preferences of another community that does not intersect with the food preferences in the local community. Whereas if they were planting for local communities, they were planting the vegetables that local communities eat. And you know, and then you can encourage for them to diversify. We found that we were facing so many challenges that were so much common and we didn't know whether we were coming or we were going. And after the research was finished, then the idea was that we can't just now disperse again. I can't just go back to my space. We should keep this relationship that we formed going. So then we decided, okay, let us um, have a formation of a body. But in the interim, we are not, we are still exploring and we are doing even more research towards this body that we are forming. But mostly we want a body that will advocate for the struggles that we as small farmers are facing. 27% of children is stunted. Why? Because of lack of, lack of nutrition. Mm. And I was shocked when I discovered that, that, uh, that research. So for me as an urban agriculture farmer, it's vital that we get the support from government because they support commercial farmers. It's not that we started uh, this thing uh, a, a few years back. It's been going on since, uh, since the first settlers arrived here. Uh, that's why I'm part of, of, of this committee that will engage with world government to the top level. There's no going back now. The mayor asked us to do this. 
Um, the reason is that we are looking at reviewing the urban agriculture policy. So we are here to listen and to understand what the issues are so that we can then start to incorporate those into how we start to take things forward. This is the first time that we've been part of a research for this long and to, to this, to up to here. We've always been specimens, we've always been part of statistics where people come and they do research and we don't know what happens to it. So we've also been part of a situation like this where we talk and talk and talk mm -hmm. and the officials take notes and then they shove it under a pile mm -hmm. of papers on that's their desk and that's it. So I want to highlight that we are taking notes because now we have decided that genoeg is genoeg. It is now time to act.